Hello fellow pedestrians. In this video, we are deriving one of the most uh, famous equations in physics, namely uh, E equals mc squared, which uh, manifests the equivalence of energy and mass of a body or a particle, if you will. Now, in 1905, Einstein uh, published his uh, paper uh, about uh, special relativity, but uh, it was not until 1912 that this uh, relation uh, was explicitly uh, written in the manuscript of special relativity. Einstein derived this relation using uh, energy and momentum conservation, Lorentz transformations and uh, thought experiment involving light emission. We on the other hand won't be so elegant uh, about it, and we are going to derive this equation using a different uh, type of machinery, that of the action and uh, of the Hamiltonian uh, formalism. Our end goal is to find uh, the energy. Now we know that the total energy of a system can be derived by the Hamiltonian, which is known to be the generalized momentum, which is just the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the generalized velocity times the generalized velocity, so we are talking about three dimensions, minus the Lagrangian. So we just need to formulate a Lagrangian that is relativistic for our frame. Now let's start with the non-relativistic case. So let's say we have the non-relativistic case. and uh, try to express the action for this. Now, the action is uh, one of the most useful uh, and uh, profound quantities in physics, uh, which actually measures the effort of a system's evolution, and it's deeply tied to the energy and dynamics of the system. Uh, so you can also derive equations of motion using the action, but we're not doing this here. So the action, which is known to be uh, the integral over time of the Lagrangian for the non-relativistic free particle, so the integral over time for the non-relativistic free Lagrangian, where this Lagrangian is known to be the kinetic minus the potential energy, and this is zero for a free particle, so we're only left with the kinetic energy, which is mass over 2 times the spatial velocity squared. Now, for our relativistic case, our action will be determined by posing two requirements. Firstly, we need, of course, relativistic invariance. And secondly, we need that uh, the relativistic action uh, at its limit should uh, produce the non-relativistic action. So the limit of the relativistic action when the velocity is very small in comparison with the speed of light should give us the non-relativistic case. Right? Now, for the relativistic invariance, in every physical theory, uh, the goal is to construct an action which is invariant under certain transformations. That's why we need this thing called relativistic invariance. Uh, and these transformations are related to that symmetry. In our case, the action should be invariant under something called the Lorentz transformations. Uh, the space where this invariance is naturally manifested, is formulated to be the Minkowski space. But uh, we are not going to conserve ourselves with any for vector notation. So let's uh, look at it in a more conceptual way. Consider the invariant length uh, of the interval separating two events now in Newtonian physics. So let's say we have a three-dimensional Euclidean space, which we know that delta s, so the invariant length is just going to be 
delta x squared. Though, so the changes in configuration in uh, its dimension. This quantity has meaning in uh, Newtonian physics since time is absolute. In special relativity, however, this is not correct. Space and time are linked into space-time. Now we know, uh, as Einstein showed, that in special relativity, a moving observer may see shorter spatial distances, but a longer time interval. So, to formulate a, a proper invariant length, so this to hold in special relativity, should be modified to be able to cancel out these changes. So, firstly, we need this interval to be invariant relativistically, or to put it differently, like we said, uh, when an observer sees shorter spatial distances, and longer time intervals, right? Now also consider an observer that moves with the speed of light. It's a uh, change in configuration since the uh, speed of light is constant with respect to any inertial frame, it's just going to be this, right? Where this squared can also be written as c squared, delta tau squared, right? Or c squared, delta tau squared, minus delta x squared is zero, right? And for an observer that moves with the speed with the speed of light, this is going to always be true. But take a moment and check this relation. This seems to be a relativistically invariant. Why? Because uh, shorter spatial distances and longer time intervals are going to cancel out because of the minus here. So, a pretty good educated guess is that our interval is just going to be written as this quantity here. And this is indeed the case. When this is zero, this is called light-like, meaning that the observer uh, moves with the speed of light. In general, though, this can be rewritten as 1 minus the velocity squared over c squared, this is the velocity, and it's going to be greater than 0. So it's positive. Why? Because this is always less than the speed of light, so this is positive. And of course, this is positive. And this is called uh, time-like. Now, because this interval is uh, positive, it means that events are causally connected and the order of observations uh, remain the same. Now, the change in the time of the clock, because in this case, where this is positive, we can always assume a rest frame. So, the change in time of clock that uh, measures the time of the particle is going to be called delta tau. And it, this is delta s over c, and this is called the proper time. Now, since this is a relativistic invariant, so delta s is a relativistic invariant, this is just a constant, so the proper time is also Lorentz or relativistically invariant. And infinitesimally, this can be written as the tau is the s over c. So, now we have a quantity that we can integrate over instead of our classical time. So, for an educated guess of the relativistic invariant, uh, for the rel relativistic action, let's say we have a constant that we're going to find later over the tau, which is shown to be the tau square root of 1 minus x dot squared over c squared. And this is indeed the relativistic action.
because this term here is relativistically invariant. Now, for the second condition, where the limit of the relativistic action, when this fraction goes to zero, should be the non-relativistic action. And since that means that this fraction goes to zero, we can tailor expand this function here, which for an arbitrary variable, let's call it zeta, can be easily shown to be one plus zeta over two. So the expansion of the relativistic action is going to be written as alpha times delta one minus x dot squared over two c squared. And it's going to be equal to the non-relativistic action, which is mass over two times the t of x dot squared. Now, when dealing with actions in physics, we drop the total derivatives. Why? Because uh, they do not alter the equations of motion. So the physics remain the same uh, if we add the constant that is going to matter, not matter at all. So we can drop this. And that leaves us that this constant that we wanted to identify just minus mc squared. So we are really getting somewhere here. So finally, the relativistic Lagrangian reads alpha, so minus mc squared, times this guy over here. So, because remember, this is just alpha delta of L. So this is 1 minus x dot squared over c squared. And this can be also rewritten in another way. This is just the reciprocal of something called uh, gamma of Lorentz. So mc squared over gamma. And what we also need is the derivative of the Lagrangian uh, with respect to the generalized velocity. This is going to be given us minus mc squared, you take the derivative over 2, 1 minus square root of 1 minus x dot squared over c squared, times minus 2 x dot over c squared. And this is going to be m gamma x dot. If we plug this into the Hamiltonian, which, remember, is this derivative here times the velocity minus the Lagrangian. So this guy times again this, so squared minus the Lagrangian, so plus mc squared over gamma. And if we do some calculations, this can be written as x dot squared plus the squared times. 1 over gamma, so squared, sorry, so 1 plus x dot squared over c squared. And this and this is going to drop, so we're left with m gamma c squared. And what we said, that this is the energy of the system, right? And also, for a particular rest, gamma goes to 1. Remember, gamma is just 1 over square root of 1 minus x dot squared over c squared. So for very small velocities with respect to the speed of light, this term is going to go to zero. So the Hamiltonian, or else the energy, is just m times 1 times c squared, so m c squared. And there you have it. This is the relation that Einstein derived and so that there is an equivalence of energy and mass for particles. And if you go to any Wikipedia page for an arbitrary particle, let's say you go ahead and check the mass of the neutron, you will see that it's also going to be written in, some, um, in mega EV or something, which is a unit of energy. So its mass is going to be written as a mega EV. That's why in many relativistic uh, texts, this is going to be just one, set to one, dimension-wise. Right? Now, we could stop here, but um, 
we could uh, delve uh, a little bit uh, deeper. Why? Because we, uh, having formulated this, we can derive the most general relation between energy and mass. So, imagine we have to find the three momentum, right? This is just mass times the velocity of the frame, which is with respect to tau. So this is rewritten as dx over the tau, the tau over the tau, right? And this is nothing more than gamma. This is gamma, right? Like we showed. So m times gamma times x dot. And we also know that the energy is given as gamma m c squared, right? Now, if you go ahead and express the velocity as p over gamma m, this is written as p squared over epsilon. Okay, and if you plug this in gamma, so gamma is 1 over 1 minus p squared, so to the fourth e squared c squared, or 1 over gamma is just square root of 1 minus p over epsilon squared and 1 over gamma is also mc squared over epsilon so equal to this And if you go ahead and uh, square uh, both terms and multiply with uh, epsilon squared, what you're left with is that epsilon squared is going to be the three momentum squared times speed of light squared plus mass squared times this set to the fourth. And this right here is the most general relation one could derive that implements both uh, mass, energy, and momentum. So you can see that for a massless particle, meaning that this is zero, this term, the energy of it is just going to be its uh, three momentum. For a particle at rest, you're left with the usual relation that we just derived, where e equals mc squared. And there you have it. This is the most general relation one could derive that uh, encapsules uh, all other uh, possibilities. So that's it uh, for now. Thank you all for watching this video, and I will see you soon.